Hi guys, I would like to share a message uh, today from the book of Romans. Uh, Romans 8, verse 28 and 29. Now, I realize that this is a very well-known verse for uh, most people, uh, especially uh, from the book of, of uh, Romans, and especially in chapter 8. Most of us know this by heart. Um, now this is a, a, a special passage for me because uh, this very passage, this just happens to be the text um, that was the text for my very first sermon that I preached some 28 years ago. Um, I had poured my heart into the study and the preparation and on the given day when I stood to preach, uh, now there was some stuttering and some perspiration nonetheless, I was preaching my heart out. I was filled with faith and I was filled with fire that I later began to understand that uh, was the Holy Spirit of God. And just after eight minutes, well, I, I was done. However, people said that uh, they believed that I was called to preach, and that night uh, began to change my life dramatically. Um, and so here we are, some 28 years later. Now, today we're not going to be watching the clock. In fact, we're going to be watching and waiting for God to show up and for God to do something that only God can do. And that is change lives. So let us read our text, verse 28, Romans 8, verse 28. And it says this, And we know that God causes all things to work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to His purpose. For those whom He foreknew, He also predestined to become conformed to the image of His Son, so that He would be the firstborn among many brethren. Let's take a pause to pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, I thank you for your word. I thank you for the power of your word. And Lord, I, I lift up your word to you today, and I pray that you'd use it. Use it to speak to our hearts. Use it to change lives. Father, I pray that your spirit would guide our time together, and that, Father, you would show up in the lives of those who are listening to this message. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. Amen. Uh, next month, uh, this is this is July right now, and next month, in just a few days, in August, um, it's going to mark four years since I fell over 25 feet off of my roof. Now, the fall itself was not too bad, uh, but the landing was devastating. And in fact, I broke my back in four places, I broke my pelvis in four places, and needless to say, I was racked with pain. I landed on the ground that was as hard as concrete, or maybe even harder. It knocked the air right out of me, and, and at first I didn't even know if I was going to be able to, to take another breath. But finally air found its way back into my lungs, and, and I tried to lift up, and it seemed like spears of pain shot through me. I tried to roll over and, and adjust myself, but something like lightning pulsed through the inside of my body. And I, finally my wife and my dad who was there, uh, were able to help me into the truck, and they took me to the hospital. And it took four men to get me out of the truck and put me onto a stretcher. Now, after hearing what was going on and what had happened, uh, they actually took the stretcher and they put me into an ambulance and took me to a bigger hospital that was more uh, equipped to take care of those types of falls and those types of, of injuries. So, they ran their test, they performed their care, and after a week or so, they sent me home from the hospital. Now, it took almost a year for me to be able to walk normal again. And during this time, I had many thoughts, but there were two thoughts that I had every single day. And they were this. One, God, what are you doing? And the second one was like it. God, what do you want me to do? Now, I don't know, maybe you're like me and you've gone through situations in life, some that were not easy, some that were difficult, and I want to know if, if maybe you have been in that same place too. Maybe you've been asking God, God, what are you doing? And it's not so far-fetched to realize that most of us probably ask that question. Now, I must be honest with you at this point. Uh, you see, for 10 years prior to me falling off the roof, I really wasn't living for God in the way that I should have been. Uh, no, some 10 years earlier, uh, after going through Bible school and pastoring a couple of churches for uh, almost eight years, I had gone through a life crisis uh, 
that sent me into a spiral, and I came close to making shipwreck of my faith. It was during these days, uh, learning to walk again, asking God these questions, God, what do you want me to do? And one morning, about eight months into it, I I remember going into the restroom, I was washing my hands, and I looked up, and I looked into the mirror, and I heard these words. What do I have to do? Throw you off the roof to make you understand, I want you to serve me with your life. Now, that may seem very strange to you listening to this message right now, but the reality is when I heard those words, it was a floodgate of emotions that were let loose. You see, let me, let me take you back in time to when I was 24 years old. When I first felt called to the ministry, when I first felt called to preach God's word, I couldn't believe that God was actually calling me. I mean, me of all people. But nonetheless, the, the call was there. Everyone around me seemed to confirm it, but I just couldn't believe that he would be calling someone like me. He would choose someone like me. I was in construction at the time, and I remember asking him every day, God, do you really want me to serve you in this way, to serve you with my whole life? And even though every billboard and every conversation, every sign that I saw was another sign that said, yes, serve me. So I was up on the roof one morning. And I was actually right on the edge of the roof, and, and it, was, it was as if I had heard God's words audibly. And this is what I heard him say. He said, Larry, what do I have to do? Throw you off this roof to make you understand? I want you to serve me with your life. Well, after that day, I had never asked him again. I went forward in faith. So, so here I am. Now I'm learning to walk again. And I'm crying out to the Lord every day, God, what do you want me to do? And just imagine the tears that were streaming down my face as as those words echoed through time to my present situation. And he said, what do I have to do? Throw you off the roof? Well, evidently, evidently God had to throw me off the roof. Now, whether, whether he just let a gentle wind blow, whether he reached his hand down through time and space and, and gave me a little push... Nonetheless, God allowed me to fall off that roof to speak to my heart. You see, He wanted me to serve Him. He wanted me to be wholly dedicated to Him. He wanted me to surrender to Him. He wanted me to know once again that He wanted to use my life. It was not finished. It was not over. God wanted to use my life for His purposes. So once again, I went forward in faith. But I must tell you, I never truly understood the powerful promise of Romans 8, 28, and 29 until that day. You see, God truly does work all things to the good of those who love Him and are called according to His purpose. And that day I bowed to the sovereignty of God, no longer fussing and fighting against life, but living in the power of God's promises. In fact, I stand here right now, telling you that falling off of that roof and breaking my bones was one of the best things that ever happened in my life. And I want to impress upon you today that whatever is happening in your life, whatever is going on in your life, the good and the bad, it is for your good and God's glory. Let me share my outline with you just so you can follow the progression of where we're going. Number one, we need to dissect the promise. Number two, we need to disclose the purpose. And number three, we need to discover the provision. So number one, we need to dissect the promise. Uh, uh, First of all, let us understand that the verse is not saying that God actually causes all of those things to happen. But he is saying that God can take all of those things that are already happening and he can reach into there with his sovereignty and create something that is going to be good in the outcome. He works them for the good of those who love Him and are called according to His purpose. Let me say it another way. God is in all things, working all things out. You see, whatever is going on in your life today is going on because God has either made it happen or He has allowed it to happen. He has ordained it or allowed it. And He does so on purpose. Make no mistake, it is God who is working in your life. It is God who is is forming and fashioning 
fashioning these things that are going on in your life. I'm talking about the God of the Bible. I'm talking about God who is the creator of the heavens and the earth. God who is the author and the sustainer of life. God who is all-knowing and God who is all-powerful. God who is present in each person's life all at the same time. God who is the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. It is this God, the God of the Bible, who is at work in your life. This is significant because in this text, the sovereign God of the universe gives us a glimpse of his amazing love for his children. And as we see how intimately involved he is in every single thing. And now, we may not like it, and it might not feel good, but you don't even have to like it. You just have to know that he is. But what things are we talking about? Notice, first of all, that our text didn't say that it was just some things. Our text didn't even say that it was just a few things. No, let me remind us that our text said, we know that God causes all things. All things should be understood as completely comprehensive. This is the, the beautiful things and the best of things. Now, this is the bad things and the broken things. The baffling things and the bitter things. The betrayals and the backbiting. Now, this is literally the good, the bad, and the ugly. This is the tragic and, and the catastrophic. This is those small, everyday little problems and those big burning down the house problems. God is working in all of it. Now, isn't that reassuring? I mean, to know that no matter the circumstance, no matter what it looks like, no matter what it feels like, no matter if it makes sense to us or not, God has chosen, listen to me, my friend, God has chosen to be involved intimately in your life. But for who's good? Who's good? Well, for the good of those who love God and for those who are called according to his purpose. You see, here's the, here's the place where I have to share some bad news. Uh, here it is. Uh, the promise is not universal. Uh, that is, it is not a promise everyone just gets to claim. I know that we live in a name it and claim it society where we just grab and pick and, and choose pieces and parts out of the Bible and say, yes, this is the part I want. Yes, this is the piece I'll take. And we want to name it and claim it and say, this is for me. Well, that's not how it works, my dear friend. No, there are two qualifiers for God to be working all things for your good. At first, he works for the good of those who love him. If you love God, you can trust that he is working for your good. But if you don't love God, if you're, if you're only giving lip service to God, if you're only doing it because of what others think, if you only go to church every once in a great while, maybe you're the C&E Christian. Christmas and Easter is when you go and, and you show your face. Other than that, you live for yourself. Then, my friend, this promise is not yours. But secondly, he works for those who are called according to his purpose. And in fact, the wording of this verse suggests that the two qualifiers, uh, loving God and experiencing his call, are actually one. You see, those who love God are called according to his purpose. They're a hand in hand. So we, we must ask the question, do you love God? I mean, do you love God with all of your heart, with all of your strength, with all of your soul, with all of you? Do you love God? Well, 1 John 4.19 says, We love him because he first loved us. Now you may be asking yourself, Well, preacher man, when did God love me? Ah, that's a great question. Because Romans 5.8 says, But God shows his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. And you see, if you can say in your heart tonight that you love God, then make no mistake, it is because God loved you first. God was working in your heart. God was drawing you near. God was reaching through whatever he had to go through to grab your heart and draw you to himself and bring you to him so that you could have a relationship with him. 
God was calling you to himself. Now, have you trusted Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins? That is, have you repented of your sins? That's, that's not just a saying sorry. Have you repented of your sin? Have you turned away from your sin and gone to the Lord Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins and began following him? You see, it's, a, it's an abandonment of an old way of life and following Jesus Christ. Do you love God? Is God calling you today? Wherever you're at, whatever you're doing, you're watching this video, you're listening to the sound of my voice, and maybe it is that God is desiring to reach into your life today for you to give your life to Christ. This begs the question, as we go through all of these things, we go through the difficulties of life, we go through the hardships, and, and it's all for what? what? What is the purpose? I've talked to many Christians who have yet to understand, what is the great purpose of life? Why am I here? Why am I going through these things? Why is God working so intimately in all of these little details of my life? Why is God working in all things? Well, number two, we need to disclose the purpose. And here it is in plain black and white. Here it is, straight from God's word. In verse 29, he says, For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to become conformed to the image of his Son. Did you catch that? God is working in all things. God is intimately involved in your life because He wants you to be conformed to the image of His Son. Now, dear friends, we must understand that God's greatest goal for us is not perfect health and pure happiness, but in fact His primary purpose is to conform us to the image of Jesus Christ. Those whom He foreknew. He also predestined. Predestined means that it's something that's predetermined. What is predetermined in this particular verse that we're looking at? It is that every believer will be conformed to the image of his Son. And God in his great love, God in his wisdom, God will utilize every circumstance to accomplish this purpose. You see, our choices are real. But no matter what we choose, God's purposes to conform believers to His image still stands. You see, God allows things in our life that will drive us to Him. And he will allow things to come in and remove and cut away the things that keep us from being conformed to His image. You may be saying, right now. But Larry, I, I thought you said that these promises were for our good. Did I misread something? Oh no, you, you read it right. And, and you might be saying, what I'm going through doesn't feel good. Uh, what I'm going through doesn't even look good. In fact, what I'm going through isn't good at all. Well, we, we must define the good that God is working to produce in us on His terms, not ours. You see, God knows that our greatest good is to know Him and enjoy His presence forever. To be more and more like Him. To enjoy the fellowship with Him. But as Scripture tells us, you cannot have fellowship with darkness and have fellowship with light. Therefore, He may then, in pursuit of this final good, allow difficulties. Such as poverty. Such as grief such as ill health, and other things to afflict us. Why? Our joy will come not from knowing that we're never going to face those kinds of difficulties, because in fact, certainly we will, but that whatever the difficulty, our loving Father is at work to make us more like Him and stronger Christians, to draw us closer to Him, to bind us together with Him. Uh, many times... Our real problem is this. We don't actually know what's good for us. I'm reminded of Isaiah 55, 8 and 9. It says, For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. 
For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. You see, therefore, God does not leave it to us to decide what is good. God tells us what is good. What is good for us is to be conformed to the image of Christ. And God intends to utilize every single thing that happens in our life to conform us to the image of His Son. I'm reminded of a story of a man who, on his lunch breaks, would walk uh, downtown to get a sandwich. And they were building this big, huge church. And, and he began to observe the construction. And, and as he was watching one of the masons uh, banging away on a rock, it looked like to him. And so finally he would stop, and he would watch, and he would observe. And, and finally, after several days of this, he, he went up to the man and he said, Excuse me, sir, what is it that you're doing? And, and the man said, well, with his hammer and chisel, chipping away at the stone, he would, he would do that for a minute. He would go and look at the building, and he would kind of size things up, and, and he would come back, and he'd chip away a little bit more. And, and he said, well, what I'm doing is I'm, I'm chipping away at this down here, so it'll, it'll fit in up there. Friends, you ever, you ever feel like that stone? Do you ever feel God's hammer and chisel? Chipping away, removing away the things that, that will cloud the image of His Son. Things that are in the way of us becoming more and more like Him. You see, sometimes God allows us to become broken. And it's in that brokenness that He transforms us. It changes us. There's those things that we go through, those difficulties that we go through. And when we come back from this deep pain, we are different than who we were before. Sometimes it opens our eyes and it allows us to begin to see the things around us the way that God sees. Now, other times it opens our heart that, that our heart might begin to, to love the way that God loves. And you see, that's the power of brokenness. And do you know why that's such a good thing? Well, here it is. It's because God uses broken things. You'll never be more useful than when you are conformed to the image of His Son. The broken body of Jesus Christ was nailed to a cross, and God used that perfect sacrifice to pay for the sins of all who would come down through time and trust in Him. And so I have to ask you the question, I had to ask it of myself, but I ask it of you now. Do you look like Jesus? Do others see Jesus in you? Now, you don't have to answer it out loud. Oh, but dear friend, you have to answer it. Do I look like Jesus? Now, we've dissected the promise. We've disclosed the purpose. Now let's discover the provision. You see, God has provided exactly what we need to get through the all things of life. And that's the helper, the, the Holy Spirit. Verse 26 of this same chapter says, In the same way the Spirit also helps our weakness, for we do not know how to pray as we should, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. And he who searches the heart knows what the mind of the Spirit is, because it, he intercedes for the saints, listen to this, according to the will of God. You see, as God begins to work all things for our good and for His glory, He knew in His wisdom, He knew that we couldn't do it on our own, even though you and I try. Right? Let's be honest. We try to do it on our own, but God knows better. And he knows that we become worried and weary. And God knows that our tank will get empty. And he knows that our faith will, will falter and sometimes fail. And he knows that there'll be times when we hit rock bottom again. 
And he knows that sickness would, would come and seize us and when the enemy would come and try to attack us and infirmities would, would keep us limping along. And sometimes losing loved ones. Or when the cupboards are bare and the pockets are empty. And we have to trust in him to come through. Or when your children make poor choices or when your spouse walks out the door. Whatever the circumstance, whatever the situation, God knows. Now, I'm not sure that you knew this, but, but listen up. Every believer has a power bank of prayer covering you at all times. Did you know that? Verse 26 says, The Spirit Himself intercedes for us. The implication is the Spirit helps us in our weakness because we don't know at times, in fact, most of the times, I believe, we don't know how to pray and we don't know what to pray for. Verse 27 says, Let us know that not only is the Spirit praying for us, but the Spirit is praying according to the will of God. But hang on. It gets better. I remember the old commercial where they're, they're selling stuff and they keep adding stuff and they keep adding stuff and he's like, but wait, there's more. Well, friends, I feel like that because, because down in verse 34, it says this, Christ Jesus is he who died, yes, rather who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, who also intercedes for us. You see, friends, don't miss this. We have the Holy Spirit of God interceding for us, even with groanings that we can't, we can't even utter because He can dive into us and knows exactly what's going on. And He begins to pray for us according to God's will. And then we have Jesus Christ who is high and lifted up and sitting at the right hand of God who is ever interceding for us. And then it gets even better. He says that we, you and I, Bible-believing Christians, if we've been born again, we have the right to go to the throne of grace and to receive mercy in a time of need. We are covered in prayer. I know that you're, you're saying, Larry, it doesn't feel like it. It feels, it feels hard. It feels tough. And maybe it is that you're saying, Larry, you have no idea what I'm going through. Well, that's okay. Because God knows what you're going through. And He's the one that can help you. You see, don't miss this. You are never stronger than when you are weak. Listen to what the Apostle Paul says in 2 Corinthians chapter 12 and verse 9. He says this, Paul is quoting Jesus who said, My grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. You see, God is perfect in every way, giving him the power to make up for any of the weaknesses that Paul may have had. And listen to me, God is stronger and more powerful to be able to make up for any of the weaknesses that we have. And we have quite a few. Now, Paul says because of this, he will be even more aware and vocal about his weaknesses in order that God's power and God's might would come in and support him. God's power perfects our weaknesses, allowing us to do so much more than what we could ever do and being able to do those impossible things, like to be able to get through those all things. Paul goes on in verse 10 saying, this is why, for Christ's sake, I delight in my weaknesses, in insults, in hardships, in persecutions, in difficulties. For when I am weak, then I am strong. Let me ask you a question this morning. Is this, is this your promise? Do you love God? Have you been called according to his purpose? Have you, have you trusted in the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior? Have you, have you repented? I ask again. Let me ask you a question. Are you still trying to handle things on your own, in your own strength? Maybe it is, if you're honest, you would confess that you don't look a lot like Jesus. Maybe it is because you don't care. Maybe it is because you just don't know him. 
Now, maybe you have no strength, and you don't look like Jesus, and you've never repented of your sin. My friend, if that's you, you have no promise and no hope of heaven. But the good news is, is that Jesus is waiting for you. And maybe it is that even through this message, you can hear him knocking at your door. And the Lord Jesus Christ says, come. Come, all of you who are weary, come. Maybe you need the Lord Jesus Christ to come and revive your soul, forgive you of your sins. My dear friend, give this some thought today. God works all things to the good of those who love him and are called according to his purpose. Is that let me pray with you. Heavenly Father, Lord, I lift up this one that's watching this video. Lord, the one that you're speaking to, the one that you're ministering to right now through your Holy Spirit. Lord, would you, would you lift them up? Would you save her soul? Would you, would you save his soul? Would you help them to turn to you right now and, and give their life to you? Father, to repent of their sin and to be able to turn to you and trust in you, that perfect sacrifice that paid for the penalty of our sin. Father, would you come and have your way in the heart of your people. In Jesus' name, amen.